I'd like to start with a question of do you work for your cows or do you or do your cows work for you? Again, do you work for your cows or do your cows work for you? Over the last three winters, our cow herd has paid us $40 a day to do nothing for them. Say what? $40 per day? Tell me more, Nathan. So using the philosophy of a penny saved is a penny earned, our cows grazing cover crops that have been seeded onto our cropland have required less feed, less protein supplement, less attention, less work, less manure hauling, less yardage costs, and other associated costs of a cattle herd for me to do nothing but let them do what they were designed to do, and that's graze on the landscape. Next slide. I'm Nathan Anderson. Uh, our family operates Bobolink Prairie Farms in Cherokee County in Northwest Iowa. Our farm's mission is to honor God, our family, and community by caring for the resources that we've been entrusted and in doing so build a resilient and enduring farm and family. And we're thankful for the opportunity to be here today. Um, and I'd like to also send out a quick apology to those who graze something besides cows. Um, that's not me. Uh, and so I'm gonna, my talk and discussion will be very cow centric. So. Uh, apologies in advance to sheep, goat, and other grazing uh, folks in the audience. But I appreciate you, and hopefully you can translate some of what we're going to share into, into uh, whatever language you need for whatever herd you have. And I'm Megan Filbert. I'm the Livestock Program Manager at Practical Farmers of Iowa and have been working on grazing cover crops and the economics of grazing cover crops for the last five years. And I am also a beginning farmer and I graze sheep and goats. So Nathan, I have those folks covered when those questions come up. So firstly, we would love to poll all of you, make sure you're still with us um, and just to learn a little bit more about the audience and your experience around grazing cover crops. So if you could answer this poll, please, do you graze cover crops? Okay, about 80% of you have voted. Okay, and we're seeing the overwhelming majority saying no, that you don't have livestock and just sit tight because we have um, plenty of information that's still applicable, applicable to you. Um, we also have a quarter of you saying no, but you're interested in grazing cover crops. And then about 9% have been grazing cover crops for one to three years and greater four or greater years. Thanks so much for taking that. And next slide. Why graze cover crops? The presentations this morning set us up really nicely to talk about the reasons to graze cover crops. There are a plethora of benefits and I specifically listed three of them here and we'll briefly touch on a few of the other benefits. So one is to extend your grazing season in the fall and the spring. So right now there are folks out there, there that they're cool season perennial pastures have gone dormant, but they were able to transition their herd onto a cover crop for fall and winter grazing. We know that grazing cereal rye in the spring provides relief to your spring pastures that are comprised of cool season perennials. 
that that um, cereal rye is the very first thing to green up in the spring, and you can get some pretty darn good grazing out of it, depending on the weather, of course, in March and April and potentially even into May if you're planting later. And then, of course, the big thing that we want to hit on is that grazing cover crops saves you money and reduces your reliance on stored feed, whether that's hay or other feedstuffs. And we know that depending on the year and depending on the moisture we've had, that price of hay can be really variable. A couple of the other reasons that I want to mention are that many of the farmers I work with got into grazing cover crops so they could calve their cows out on in the spring on a fresh clean bed of cereal rye. If they didn't have that cereal rye to calve on, they would be calving in a lot that's filled with a lot of mud and manure. And that is not the most ideal way for that calf to start its life. The second is we know that cover crops and grazing them is a way to increase the carrying capacity of your land, especially if you don't have as much pasture as you'd like. The, another, another reason is that when you're grazing, you are depositing manure where it's needed in the crop field. And then of course, what Andrea started us out with this morning is all of the benefits that come along with soil health and increased microbial activity through the act of grazing and animal impact. Next slide. It's important when you're looking at incorporating grazing into your cover crop system or using cover crops as an addition to your existing row crop system to provide forage, it's important that you set your expectations. And one of the primary things that I'd like to encourage when you set those expectations is to use basic agronomic principles. You use basic agronomic principles that apply to your corn, your soybeans, or your other primary crops. Uh, you need to use the same basic agronomic principles applying to your cover crops. Um, as a couple of the other speakers have already mentioned, uh, setting expectations and being realistic about the amount of growth that you can expect with a cover crop that's seeded after the uh, average first frost date in your area that might not overwinter. So be sure to set your expectations. Um, and it's important to ask a lot of questions of what goals you have and what system you're currently in. Uh, so are you in a corn and soybean rotation? Are you in a corn soybean rotation, but you grow some small grains and you might be able to incorporate a greater diversity and have greater biomass earlier in the, earlier in the fall or late summer, depending on your time frame? Um, do you need to graze in the spring? When, when do you calve? Uh, when is your, uh, when does your pasture run out? When does your pasture start, your perennial pasture? Um, that helps determine if you need feed in the fall or the spring or both, uh, or what you might be able to fit. And then what species can you use? Uh, what, what cover crop species do you have access to? What cover crops can, again, agronomically fit into the system that you're working in? What cover crop species can you seed on the landscape? Do you have the right tools or access to tools uh, that can get that cover crop seed out on the landscape? Uh, do you need to interseed um, at, at, as the picture on the left shows, interseed before harvest? Uh, do you need to wait until after harvest? Um, and all of the things in between. So setting expectations is an important part of the process of trying to figure out where your gaps are in your grazing system and what you're trying to fit in. Um, and just as an example, the, the two pictures here are of, if, of the same field, um, the same mix. Uh, this mix is about 20 pounds uh, winter cereal rye, 20 pounds spring barley, uh, a little bit of rapeseed, turnip, and forage kale mixed in with it as well. Uh, so the picture on the left was taken in mid-October at harvest, and the picture on the right was taken in late December uh, when the cattle were, just before the cattle were turned out to that field, and that's a close-up of what's still there uh, for them to, to possibly graze on in addition to the, the corn stalk residue. Next slide, please. 
So now for a few economic expectations. We've been doing on-farm research around the economics of cover crop grazing for five years now, and that's funded through the Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship uh, Water Quality Initiative Project. And we've been collecting data from integrated crop and livestock farmers in the North Raccoon Rivershed primarily, and each farmer grazes their cow-calf herd on cover crops. So what we've done is we've recorded all cover crop costs and the labor involved for seeding and all of the grazing data. And I'm showing a sn snippet of that data from fall 2018 and spring 2019 grazing. These farmers on average profited $90 an acre when grazing cover crops by saving money on hay. They did not have to buy or feed as much hay. I want you to keep in mind that these numbers were calculated when hay was going for $150 per ton. It's a bit lower this year, about $100 to $120 a ton. So this number might not look as quite as high, but I just want to express that there is variability depending on the year and how much hay is going for. But really the bottom line that we've shown time and time again through on-farm research is that grazing cover crops has the potential to put money back in your pocket within that same year of planting those cover crops. So you are able to reap short-term economic benefits when you add value to those cover crops through a ruminant animal. So what is a forage chain? Think of a forage chain as an actual chain with links in it. Each link represents a different type of forage. A complete chain would look like a sequence of forages to graze year round. And year round grazing is the ultimate goal for many producers that we work with. Winter and summer annual forages, and in this case, we're calling them cover crops, complement perennial pastures. Therefore, they're adding links to your chain at different times of the year. Nathan, what do your forage chains look like? Our forage chain on most of our landscape, most years, looks like the description on the left. Um, our primary chunk of the forage chain, or to continue the mechanical metaphor, the direct drive part of it, and you just skip out the chain links and it's direct drive, is perennial pastures that is carrying our cow herd from either late April, early May, through September or October, again, depending on the year and moisture. And so for us, we need to try and connect that chain in our corn soybean system. We need to connect that chain from October to April. And the way that we do that is with cover crops. And again, we're picking species that can give us those links, connect those links in the fall for forage and then connect those links in the spring um, and possibly through the winter as much as possible. Um, on some of our landscape in some years when we have small grains, uh, our forage chain looks like the right where the bulk of our grazing still comes from perennial pastures. Uh, that is the, the main backbone of the forage chain. So that late April, May through July, uh, we're grazing in our perennial pastures on that landscape. August to September, uh, depending on the small grain that we use and the cover crop mix that we have, we're grazing some primarily summer annual forages that are filling in or, or fitting in as a cover crop. Um, as those run out or as we maybe stockpile some of those forages for grazing in the winter, which is a, a separate discussion, but uh, as those forages run out, we move back into our pasture to graze in September and October. Um, until our, the rest of our row crops, our corn or our soybeans are harvested. And then the, the cattle are back grazing those cover crops. Uh, and again, connecting those links from November uh, through the winter as much as possible into May. Um, and there's, as all of us know or are aware, there's caveats to this depending on the season. And, and we've talked about it, but I just want to reinforce that we, we graze as much as we can, but uh, with Iowa weather and uh, weather everywhere. Uh, there's definitely times of the year where we're, we're feeding hay, uh, whether snow or ice, the snow is too deep or, or we have ice, or there's 
just a greater energy requirement due to sustained cold. Um, we're supplementing feed in those scenarios. Uh, and in this case, uh, times of drought uh, where we're able to graze cover crops that we have, but our growth has been really limited uh, due to drought conditions. So again, we've got to factor that in as we connect these forage chains. And when you plan out this forage chain, that allows you the opportunity to see where you might have needs for hay supplementation or other feed supplementation and allow you an opportunity to plan to fill those links and, and have, a, have a backup plan if one of the, those links gives way. Uh, so it's important to think through this process as you think through your, your needs and your goals and ac your expectations of to think through your livestock, um, both quantity needs and quality needs of feed uh, as they go through the season. And the forage chain um, discussion or thought process allows you a, a good avenue to do that. Next slide. Nathan, you've just explained that there's so much grazing potential that you've unlocked out of your acres. What do you tell other farmers about how to get started? So uh, a lot of the questions that I get are somebody looking at trying this for the first time and they want a introductory, what can I do that I can graze and leave it as open-ended as that. And, and so the, the first example that I try, and we've seen some great pictures of it already from, from Rob and, and others, um, of planting cereal rye in the fall um, into standing corn or drilled after corn harvest, and then grazing it in the spring before soybeans. Um, that allows you an opportunity to, again, graze in the spring before pasture green up or to let your pastures green up a little bit more. Um, have your cows out on a, a green surface when they're calving um, and then have less risk to your row crop system ahead of soybeans with a, a, a good stand of, of rye ahead of soybeans. So that's the basic entry level uh, thing that when, when folks ask, I, I like to recommend. There is a, a lot of opportunity and a, a lot of options, especially in a corn, soybean, small grain system. Uh, that you can use. And so I'd like to walk through a little bit of that uh, right now. So the first thing is have a goal. Um, a lot of farmers have an understanding of when they need feed uh, and what species might be able to fit in that need. Uh, for some farmers, and I, I feel this a little bit myself, sometimes the goal of the cover crop is to have something green out there that is a nice, nice even stand so the neighbors don't talk about what's going on out in that field or where, what are those gaps or what's out there. So it's important to recognize the goal um, and that leads into the, the seeding method um, that matches the goal and matches the equipment that you either have available or have access to through uh, machine rental or custom hire. Um, and I'd like to, to go through just a, a few of the species that, that I've used and the mixes that I've used, um, but I don't want to convey that this is a, a recipe that everyone should follow. Um, there are, again, if you follow some agronomic basics, you can pick some of the species that fit your uh, needs and, and match what you have access to. Uh, so for me, for fall grazing, uh, my favorite forage species is spring barley. Um, and one of the reasons, or a couple of the reasons I like spring barley is it's a heavier seed than oats. So for us, a lot of our seeding involves either broadcasting or, you know, broadcasting through ground equipment or in some cases, aerial equipment. And barley with that seed being a little more dense allows that custom applicator to have more capacity in their seed hopper. Uh, they can carry more seed than something like oat. Um, Oats work and, and they can be great. And sometimes they can be very cost effective. Uh, and so it's not to knock on oats by any means. Oats, um, spring wheat is another one that you can get to graze in the fall. And then depending on your time frame, I always like to include brassicas as well. They're very cold tolerant and can get started very well uh, later in the season. So things that have been mentioned already, you know, forage kale, uh, some of the turnip, brassic, or turnips, uh, rapeseed, brown mustard, uh, radishes, possibly. And my mix will vary depending on the cost of, and availability of, of those items. And 
when I can access that seed and when I can access the field to get things planted. Um, grazing in the fall for a lot of what we do, I'm, I'm hesitant to mix a legume in unless we have an early window or favorable weather, or I can find something reasonably cheap. Um, and the, the legume that probably makes it into my mixes the most is common vetch. Um, and hairy vetch is, is a lot more common, I think, for a legume species. Uh, the reason I've used common vetch when I've used it is just because the seed was cheaper. Uh, that's, that's about the only reason. Um, if spring grazing, uh, the primary one, again, it comes back to a grass species, uh, but winter cereal rye. So the rye grain, not, not rye grass. I really want to emphasize that one, um, rye grain. Uh, and that's seeded in the fall. And again, depending on when you can get it seeded, uh, as a couple of our other speakers have mentioned, depending on when you can get it seeded, you'll have varying amounts of tillering in the fall. You might be able to graze some in the fall, um, but your greater chunk of biomass is going to come in the spring. I do like to mix brassicas in uh, with this mix as well, just for some diversity. Again, I fall back on the same ones, the rapeseed, turnip, brown mustard, kale, um, radish possibly, although those, that seed is usually a little more expensive. Um, after small grains, there's a greater variety of uh, options available and, and it gets gets pretty fun. Uh, primarily, again, using a, a grass species to generate the bulk of the forage. Uh, sorghum, sorghum sedan hybrids, and millets uh, make up the bulk of some of those mixes. Um, and then you have a great opportunity to mix in legumes if you're looking to add protein into the feed or fix nitrogen for the following year. Uh, if you're coming back to a corn crop or other crop uh, that is a nitrogen user, things like cow peas and clovers. Um, I've had mixes, again, it's really fun. It's, it's one of the, the return on investment numbers are, are great, but the fun of having cows grazing in a massive chunk of diverse cover crop mix or annual forage mix is, is really fun also. And that uh, is, is motivating to continue to do it. So things like uh, buckwheat have been in this mix. There's a bunch of summer brassicas, sun hemp, uh, safflower, oilseed sunflower, some of those species that you can mix in um, just to have diversity in the mix. And it's important that you recognize as you mix those in what the feed value of those things might be and then what the familiarity of your cow herd with those species might be. Sometimes cows uh, need to learn to graze a new species. And so you can influence that by... Um, shortening up their grazing window or the area that they have, having a higher stock density, uh, grazing density, increasing the duration. So you kind of force them to eat more in there. Uh, and again, this is all consideration given to animals health as well. You don't wanna restrict them to a certain area to force them to eat things that aren't nutritious or are going to, to harm them in any way, but you're using that grazing management to influence the consumption of those species that are new uh, to some of your cows or other grazing animals, even though they might be still a nutritious forage, they're new. Um, and I do wanna take a, a minute to mention a couple of the cautions and I've seen a couple of them in the questions. There was a question about herbicide carryover. Uh, that's very important to, to watch the herbicide labels that you're using uh, to allow you to intercede or to, to seed some of these cover crop mixes. Uh, crop insurance was brought up a lot in the last session. Make sure you're following crop insurance requirements. Um, prussic acid, I saw some sorghum sedan questions. Uh, you know, prussic acid risk after a, a, a frost or freeze in the fall. Grass tetany uh, with early grazing in the spring. Um, and then possibility of some high traffic areas uh, depending on, uh, and I see perhaps fall uh, on there also on the grass tetany. So thanks for clarifying that too. You can see it at different times through the year depending on the forage. Uh, that you have. Um, so there's a, those are just a few of the things to watch out for, but I definitely think uh, you can, can manage those risks very well. And the reward is for us reducing feed costs in the single greatest cost of keeping a cow. And that's feeding her or the, or the bull, feeding your cow through the winter. Uh, so this system allows us to reduce the single greatest cost to our cow herd. Next slide. 
I want to introduce this group to a new tool we have. This is called the Midwest Grazing Exchange, which can be found at midwestgrazingexchange.com. So think of this as Tinder for cows or sheep and goats. This new matchmaking website for livestock and land, it's specifically for those folks that took the poll that, that don't have livestock or may have livestock and haven't grazed cover crops yet. Um, so for those of you that are looking for your neighbor's livestock to graze or for livestock farmers who want more forage, which who, who doesn't, right? This is a free site. You can create a, an account and explore all of the listings and then go ahead and add a listing yourself. You can upload a picture of your land or livestock, just like a dating website, and then hopefully find your perfect match. You can also choose the season you're looking to graze, the type of forage you're looking to graze. So it's not just for cover crops. We also included crop residue, pasture, woodlands, urban lands. We get a lot of calls at our office around, um, you know, grazing, using goats for invasive species in backyards. So this is, has to do with everything grazing, but really it was born out of the interest to, of people asking us that they, they want more cover crops grazed and that they don't have livestock to do so. So we urge you to take a look at this free website and sign up to use it. Again, MidwestGrazingExchange.com. Next slide. Nathan, you're muted. Yeah, thank you. So important to ask the question again, do you work for your cows or do your cows work for you? This little nugget uh, was given to me by a, a PFI member at a field day. Uh, my first year back on the farm after graduating from Iowa State and thinking I knew what I was doing when it came to a grazing system and was talking about all the things that I was gonna be doing um, this individual, I appreciate uh, very much, stopped me dead in my tracks when I was talking and said, wait a minute, are you going to work for your cows or are your cows going to work for you? Because if you want to make money and stay in the business, your cows better work for you. All right. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Nathan. That was awesome. Um, it seems like you guys have been following the chat box, which is great. And there's already lots of resources in there that have been uploaded. So please click on those. Um, I do want to direct a couple questions to you both, though. Um, this one maybe to Nathan. Um, how long or at what point are you do you want to um, take your livestock, be it cows or something else, off of the fields before you're planting corn or soybeans? So for us, usually before planting corn, we're not grazing in that spring. If we're grazing in the spring, it's primarily before soybeans um, or they're grazing uh, on, on perennial pasture. So for us early in the spring, if cows are grazing, they're grazing before soybeans. Um, I've kept them in the field, uh, basically started planting the field. And as I make my boundary around the edge of the field, the cows kind of move up towards the the cattle yard or the, the gathering point. And uh, basically they've been in the field and until I planted it. Um, the caveat to that would be if you have high traffic areas that you need to address, you might need to get them removed um, so you can address those. Or if you need to chemically terminate uh, or mechanically terminate the cover crop before you uh, plant your primary crop, uh, but the, the short answer is I've left them in the field right up until I, I went through it with the planner. Great. And then we're getting some chatter um, about fence and fencing and any tips for that. So maybe Nathan, you can start and Megan, you can chime in about folks that are interested in getting started, but don't really know what to do about fence and, and those sorts of resources. Yeah. So for the state of Iowa, um, Iowa is not a free range state. So uh, for insurance reasons and, and for, you know, basic neighborly reasons, there's a fencing standard, the state of Iowa fencing standard. And I believe it's four strands and there's a certain minimum wire bottom and wire top. Um, that's, that's the standard. And I would be completely dishonest if I said all of our fences meet that standard because they flat out do not. Um, 
but we try to utilize existing fence. We've built a lot of fence, four and five barbed wire fence um, to be able to graze in some of our crop fields. Um, and the investment in fence versus the dollars I would spend on hay, um, I think is a good investment in fencing. And again, this is land that we have long-term control over so we can justify that expense. Uh, if, you're, if you're in a rental scenario or a shorter term land access scenario, like a, a land lease, um, I'd, I'd consider, and we're considering this too, and we're installing some of it maybe this fall or next spring of some high tensile fence, um, just so we can reduce our post space or increase our post spacing, uh, minimize, especially the, the part of the fencing that goes in the ground so that we can either change the fence or move it. And I think that would be something that would be a consideration for rented or leased uh, or other grazing arrangement property. Um, but throughout, throughout the winter, especially for us, probably the biggest challenge is when we're running electric fence in the winter to remember to have the hot and the ground wire both uh, because you can't rely on the conventional grounding system uh, that you can use in, in a grazing system in the winter. So fencing is definitely a challenge, but I think it's worth investing in fence for some of the long-term benefits and access to graze in, in crop fields. Hey, Nathan, can you give everyone a ballpark on how much it would cost to invest in a one one strand hot wire with a energizer um so I, I don't know i can't remember dollar wise exactly where it was but i compared it i did this number last year and to run two strands of hot wire around the quarter section that i was wanting to graze um would cost me about seven round bales of grass hay not including labor um, so that was, I don't know exactly where those numbers came out, but I just remember I compared it to bales and that's how I justified it of like, well, there's more than seven round bales worth of feed, uh, in that, in that field. So it's worth going ahead and, and fencing off part of it. Uh, Iowa state, um, economics, ag economics, they have a ag decision maker. They have a great breakdown on fencing costs of different fences per foot of fence. Um, so they have, they have different levels in there, but, um, I would say you can do it pretty reasonably, uh, for the, the area that you'd possibly be able to graze. Awesome. And, oh, go ahead, Megan. I do see that Frederick in the chat box has brought up virtual fence. I would be very surprised if anyone has tried it because at this point, really it's only available in California. I think they're trialing it in Ohio and then they use it in Australia and in Scandinavia, but it is an awesome technology where you essentially set your fence boundary from your iPhone and you can move it as often as you want. And the animals either have a collar or an ear tag that's giving them an oral beep when they get close to the boundary you've set and actually delivers them a shock when they're on the boundary. And then a virtual back fence appears to push them back into the area you've designated. So it's pretty cool technology that I think can, can make big waves um, when it becomes like tech technologically viable in our area. 